Okay, let's start. So let's start to use one example to illustrate how to do the estimation when the sample space is small. So recall that we have a data set containing the daily weather for the 731 days in the two years. Okay, although that's bike rental thing. For each day, we have those bike rentals and some other attributes like weather. We label those uh, possible values as 1, 2, 3, and 4 for sunny, uh, misty or cloudy, uh, light snow or rain, and heavy snow or thunderstorms. So we use four different values to denote possible outcomes or weathers. That means if we let x to be the daily weather for any given day in the future, then our sample space would just be containing four values, one or two or three or four, according to our definition. Okay, so the sample space is obviously small. If we want to estimate the probability for each value to occur, of course, what we may want to do is to look at the existing data set. What we may get is 1, 2, 3, and 4. We have all the frequencies. With some um, simple counting, we can get uh, the frequency for the value to be 1 in the past, the frequency for the value to be 2 in the past, for 3 and 4. We can get this column, right, just by simple counting. And then we can get the proportion for each value to occur here by just some division. So if we let pi to denote the probability for x to be i, we never know this, but we can estimate that p1 is 63%. P2 is 34%, and so on, and so on. Um, this is what we may do, that according to our data, what we may do, okay? So, the estimated probability distribution of x is here. This is what we can do according to our data. If we have more data, actually we can do some more. Right, we can in some sense make our estimation more accurate. More accurate. Please remind yourself that this estimation is just based on a sample, now based on the two year observations we have. So it is never right. For tomorrow, we can use these four numbers to do our prediction for tomorrow's weather. But we never know whether the probability of getting a sunny day is really 63% and so on and so on. We are not saying that for tomorrow's prediction, we have a chance to be wrong. Okay, We are not getting one number and tell, convince us that uh, this number may be wrong. No, we are, and that part is true, but we are not talking about that. We are talking about the estimation of distribution, huh? not the estimation for tomorrow's weather. Okay, We are estimating the distribution, not predicting for a value. So we are saying that this distribution is never right, Okay, because we don't know what's going to happen for the population. Okay, Because of that, so actually, manual adjustment based on experiences and or uh, domain knowledge are always allowed and actually welcome. For example, even though in the past two years there is no event for thunderstorm or heavy snow, but you know or you probably still believe that this extreme weather situation may happen in the future. Okay, so when you want to really finalize your estimation, you probably want to assign a positive probability to this event. Okay? Even though in the past two years you didn't see it, it's still possible for it to happen in the future. In that case, all you can do is to do some manual adjustments. For example, here I probably would adjust the probabilities to be 65%, 30%, 3%, and 2%. 
probably I just want to round them into um, beautiful numbers. Or if I am a weather expert, I probably can do something better. Okay, no, but manual adjustment is possible and may be needed. Or sometimes you may want to refine your estimation by considering more example. Okay, for example, when you considering weather, you probably feel that there is a trend. So you probably only want to use the data in the past year, okay, because it's closer to today. That's possible. That's possible. Also, you may want to use some other attributes or information to refine, to, to, to focus on even uh, some, some possible things. Like, if you know you want to predict the weather for one day in December, okay, one day in December, in December, then probably what you may want to do is to only look at the existing data in December, okay? For the 62 days in December in our sample, we can do the things again, counting and find the probabilities. If that's the case, then our belief on uh, bad weather, bad weather, case 2 or case 3, slightly goes up, right? And our belief on a sunny day goes up, goes down. That's because we know we want to predict for December, so we are looking at December data. And that's something you may want to do. Okay? Again, you may adjust the outcome you know, to some um, other things, like you may assign a positive probability to situation 4. Okay? That's something you may do. In general, what you may want to do is either you do manual, adju manual adjustments or you refine your estimation. Both are fine and require experiences and domain knowledge. Okay? That part, of course, we have no way to teach you. So you now have the general rule and to apply to each specific domain, then there are something that you may um, add to the existing, to the, tr to the typical method, okay? That's something you need to do. When the sample space is large, then the, the, the steps would be a little bit more complicated. And let's see how to do it. When the sample space is large, the, the method would not be very helpful. Like, if we talk about the same data set, but talks about the daily bike rentals, well, that X be the daily bike rental for tomorrow or for a specific day. We say that X is discrete, okay, because the number of daily rentals are counted. But in this case, its sample space contains at least more than 8,000 values, because if you go back to look at the data set, you basically have more than 8,000 values, uh, I mean, there are some days whose demand is more than 8,000, okay? So your sample space contains around uh, 10,000 values, but you only have 700 and it's 731 observed values, okay? So once you do the naive counting and for, to calculate the pro proportions, you will get a lot of numbers with probability zero. And for those values with probability that is positive, uh, they are almost having the same possibilities. So that method really didn't tell you anything. In this case, we need to rely on our frequency distributions, okay? The thing that we introduced at the beginning of this course to estimate the probability for the value to be within a class. Now, now it's hard to estimate x because the possibility the possible values of x becomes large okay so a easier thing or the more practical thing that we may want to do is to estimate uh, whether x would be around 1000 whether x would be around 5000 whether x would be greater than 8000 and so on we want to predict the probability for the value to be within a class 
those classes obtained in frequency distributions. After that, we may use the class midpoint to represent values in that class, or we may distribute the probabilities for that class evenly to all the values. And that means we do uniform distribution within each class. And let's see how to do it. So, <clears throat> suppose x is the daily bike rental for a given future day. Then we have the data set containing the bike rentals in the 431 days. Right? So we have those number of uh, observed values. Suppose we want to do a frequency distribution with these classes. Okay? Then by counting or by any computer techniques you have, you can get the frequency for each class. Right? And then you can get the proportion of each class or the relative frequency of each class. So this is something you know how to do. Given the ungrouped data, you may group them into, for example, here, uh, nine, classes, nine classes. If you want, you may draw a histogram. But that part is not important here. All we want are these numbers. With these numbers, basically we are saying the probability for x to be within 0 and 1,000, uh, 1, the probability is 2.5%. The probability for x to be greater than 8,000 8, is around 1.6%. Okay? With the frequency distribution, we will say that. But now, we still need to handle what's going to happen if x belongs to this class or other classes. So one way to do that is to use class midpoints. So I now collect the nine class midpoints and use them to create an artificial sample space. And then I would just assume, or artificially assume, that x may only take values of 500, 1,500, and then blah, 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 up to 8,500. So I would say, you know, I know of course it's wrong, but I would say the probability for x to be 500 is 2.5 percentage percent. The probability for x to be 1,500 okay, is around 10% and so on and so on. Okay, and that's what I would say. I am actually using the class midpoints to be our uh, representatives for each class. Okay, now, once we have this kind of numbers, then we have our estimation of probability distribution. And that can help us to predict the future bike rentals. Okay, future bike rentals. And again, we may manually adjust or refine these numbers. Okay, that's again something you may want to do. But the key point here is we don't really predict the possibility of each value. Instead, we estimate the probability for each class. And for each class, we use one value to represent that class. Um, that's the better thing we may do. Or, alternatively, you can do something else. You still start from your frequency distribution. Okay? And then for each class, you create a uniform distribution inside that class, so that the total probability of that uniform distribution is the observed proportions. Okay? Well, for example, suppose I want to say small f is my PDF of capital X, okay? For the simple space, in this case from 0 to 9000. Then within the first class, I want to make sure, I want to set all the possible values 
to be equally likely to occur. Then, my uniform distribution should have the total probability gets to 2.5%, and the area that I want to know would be 2.5% or 0 0.025, okay? The area below my PDF. So that means my small f of this uniform distribution, okay? I can calculate its height. Its height must be 0 0.000025 because this times 1000, uh, the dense of my rectangle, this times 1000 must be 0 0.025. That's how I get this value. Similarly, we can calculate the, the height of my PDF for all the classes. We repeat this until we are done. And then we may want to, for example, graphically uh, depict our PDF like this. In class 1, we have a particular height for our PDF, right? And for class 2, we have another PDF and so on and so on. So this is the outcome of our estimation. We estimate the PDF of this distribution. We estimate the PDF for this random variable. Okay, within this range, we have the likelihood like this. With the second range, we have likelihood like this, and so on and so on. We don't really care about the absolute values, right? But we care about their relative values. In this PDF, we can see it's more likely for value to be around um, 3,000 to 6,000. Okay? It's more likely for values to be here. Less likely for values to be big or small, um, natural. So this is how we get our estimation to spread the probability of each class to all the values in that class. And that just means uniform distribution. If we have PDF, of course we can also have CDF. Or given any possible value, we can calculate what's the probability for capital X to be less than that or greater than that. Like here, in this graph, we are trying to calculate the probability for X for your bike rental amount to be less than or equal to 3,500. You know how to do it. It's just an integral, or it's just a calculation of the area below your PDF within specific amounts, okay? within specific region. Once you do that, then that's your CDF, or that's your tail probabilities. If you have PDF, then you can do that. Of course, you may want to do refinements, like uh, I know this day that I'm interested in is a holiday or not. Then you may want to refine your estimation okay, according to only holiday data and so on and so on. Now, that's something you may want to do. But here, the general, the key idea is to use classes instead of specific individual values. Okay? Thank you.